Hello everyone, uh, we're happy to be here and to, to discuss uh, with you about multi-cloud Kubernetes, one GitHub slope uh, to rule them all on this uh, specific period and could say a little weird period because we were all a, a mask. Uh, I'm gonna, uh, gonna start the presentation and just remove my mask first. I think it's gonna be easier to, to hear me right now. Uh, first, we, um, I would like to uh, introduce us uh, quickly. I am uh, I'm working uh, with uh, Johan the Grey, uh, who uh, cloud DevOps engineer and tech leader on DevOps side. And uh, myself, uh, Jonathan Ranger of the South. I'm a field CTO for Capgemini, uh, based in France in Toulouse. And we're really happy uh, today to uh, sharing with you some thoughts and some uh, things we, we've done with, uh, with plant around um, GitOps and Kubernetes. Uh, first of all, I would like to, it's important to introduce uh, the GitOps um, definition, we could say, or some element about GitOps. Uh, first, uh, we could find on, on some um, work uh, previously, the GitOps for, could say, first time introduced uh, with uh, cloud native infrastructure, but for most of you, and I think, and for myself, uh, I've been in open source for, for, for 15 years now, uh, GitOps is like the basic of the infrastructure uh, for open source people and people working on Linux for years. Uh, it's mostly um, how we're using the best practice of developing and uh, the same tooling of the developers to run our infrastructure. And uh, this is for me really a way uh, just to converge uh, between uh, developer and ops on the same way, uh, uh, on the same way of working and the same tooling. And uh, that's why for me, even if I really like the, the GitLab definition of uh, the GitOps, so we're taking the best practice and we're trying to work together. And, uh, and that's exactly what we're gonna show you uh, right now with the different project and uh, with a demo at the end of the presentation. Um, may, uh, he's gonna make my uh, Johan. First, uh, just to continue on the basics about DevOps, uh, GitOps, I could say, the idea is to, to have one pipeline and uh, on, the each, on this pipeline, you're gonna have, uh, I could say, I don't like the term one pipeline, you're, you're gonna have multiple pipeline uh, and uh, each pipeline is gonna be dedicated on different components of your infrastructure and of your code. Uh, it's really important, uh, you're gonna share some tooling like, like GitHub, GitLab, for example, or the registry uh, between um, uh, the dev side and the Git side, but uh, um, technically you have to differentiate and you're gonna differentiate what is the, um, the GitOps pipeline, your pipeline to deploy uh, op operation and to deploy the infrastructure, and your, your pipeline to develop for developers. First, why you're gonna separate bo both? It's really about segregation of rights, securization of duty, and to be sure you're gonna securize well uh, your, your pipeline. But globally, you could say we're gonna use the same tooling, same pipeline to do diff two different things, set up environment and deploying software. And uh, that's the mindset of GitOps. Uh, just to give you, uh, we're gonna go through directly uh, some example right now uh, on Kubernetes for sure. Uh, we could say a uh, lot of people <laughs> like to talk about infrastructure as code. Or, honestly, I'm not a big fan <laughs> of this word. Uh, I really prefer GitOps, but I, I, I get what people try to do uh, with infrastructure as code. As code is meaning uh, you're gonna use the same way of working your infrastructure on deploying your infrastructure, and you're gonna integrate it in your, uh, you, in your development code or your application code. We're gonna, you're gonna see an example because I think Kubernetes is a great example for that. But it's a point of view because Kubernetes, it's a, we could say it's a platform itself and you have the infrastructure and you have the application. And sometimes even if the mindset is to say, okay, infrastructure as code, we're gonna put infrastructure component in your code. You have some time to separate the different workloads and to have a clear roadmap and a clear way to segregate your environment and to apply security rules and, uh, and, uh, and all the elements uh, on your infrastructure. Uh, it's not a mess, you know, it's uh, something you have to organize. You could say uh, globally what we're looking, uh, what we really like uh, to the GitOps approach, it's, it's agile. I, I put this in really small, you know, because in infrastructure being agile is not always, uh, always easy. It's open source. As I mentioned, I've been in open source for years and uh, we've been doing that for, for years or so. It's really linked with open source. Uh, it's a centralization, decentralization way of working. We're gonna talk about that later because it's an important point. 
And what you're going to look at, particularly, it's uh, a hand-to-hand -hand workload, DevOps pipeline, uh, CI, CD, and also adoption. It's really important uh, when you would like to move to DevOps, if you're sure uh, you people and you ops people, you uh, sysadmin, they're going to use the same tooling than the developer, the same process, the same way of working, it's going to be easier to work together. It's going to be easier to understand each other. And it's, it's really difficult to stay and to work on two different, uh, with two different tooling and, and approaches when you're talking about DevOps. That's why you could say you have continuous integration, which is really uh, dedicated to, uh, I'm not going to talk about GitHub, I think you're all aware <laughs> well about continuous integration, but about your code. And what you're going to talk Kubernetes GitOps, which is mostly how you're going to set up your Kubernetes, update your Kubernetes components, and all the services you're going to put on it. Uh, in it, and uh, this is uh, particularly how you could make the difference between uh, uh, GitOps. Just to give you some example, uh, I think this is, is not obvious, maybe the next one, because I would like to show you more the conceptual approach. Uh, first, you're going to have on the, on the left your main component. Uh, it could be your, uh, your master, you could say, and after you're going to develop a way to deploy uh, a Kubernetes cluster with all the tooling in it, and everything automated. And uh, I'm going to show maybe the next slide is going to be easier to understand. Just give you the example, and we're going to have, uh, Yuan is going to give us uh, a demo about that just after that. Look at this part. On the left side, you have all the DevOps tooling uh, you're going to use and you're going to deploy uh, for the different cluster you're going you're to have. For example, you have an OpenShift cluster and a Kubernetes cluster on the right. And you could say, OK. Uh, my mission is to deploy a Kubernetes on open uh, an OpenShift Kubernetes and a vanilla Kubernetes on two different places, but with the same set of tooling. On this approach of GitOps and Forge as a Service, you could say, okay, we on this side, using and leveraging this tooling to deploy and maintain and upgrade and release all deployments tool set, meaning all Kubernetes deployment, and also the tooling inside. And uh, it's, uh, it's interesting because you could see it's a really uh, a loop. Uh, it's really uh, a way of working because uh, in two you, you're using the DevOps tools to develop and maintain your environment. And in the same time, you, de you deploy these same, these same technologies into your different cluster. With this, you manage your different cluster and the other component that you upgrade with. And in here is where you're developing your platform, you develop, you release your different setup, you release the way of working. You know, it's uh, what we could name centralized way of working and decentralized way of deploying. Uh, I'm pretty sure it's not totally fully clear for you right now, but uh, <laughs> we're going to show in a demo. But uh, in that scenario, uh, and maybe what could be confusing is because you're also using Kubernetes to deploy, but it's a real loop because today you say, okay, I would like to guarantee and to ensure I'm going to have the same level of quality and quality and sel the same level of deployment on each project. And I have multiple projects of Kubernetes. And, uh, and I have to give for all these projects a set of DevOps tooling. And that's the way you're going to do. And you're going to monitor your different components with a GitLab, a registry uh, somewhere where you're going to update the Kubernetes cluster but also a way in internally you're going to manage the, uh, the life cycle of all your components in your different cluster. It's, uh, it's an interesting way. We're going to go through that also uh, later, just right now, um, and after the demo. What's going to happen also uh, when you're talking about multi-cloud uh, Kubernetes if we continue this way? And uh, today uh, on the market, you, you do have um, a bunch of solutions. Uh, all are pretty, I could say, um, young. Uh, it's not solution uh, really uh, broad or uh, really used today. But when you would like to, to work on multi-cloud Kubernetes solution, what you would like to do first is to centralize a way to manage your cluster, to apply the same rules on every cluster, manage your user, your airbag, your namespace, and every component you're going to use, and the networking, what networking part also. And you would like to centralize everything. Uh, but in the other hand, you have to decentralize the way of consuming the platform for the developer. 
and today uh, we could say you have different solution like Tanzu, Azure Arc, Rancher, Red Hat Advanced Cluster Management for Kubernetes, Antos, uh, and, uh, and the one we're gonna show you, this is really a pure GitOps approach. What's the difference between GitOps and non-GitOps? You could say most of the solution previously, you have a user interface, you have a way of working or where you're gonna just use your interface and you're gonna click, 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 click and save. And, and uh, I could say it's really an end user point of view of how you're managing your infrastructure and your component. Where in the GitOps side, uh, we're gonna really look, okay, we're gonna work with GitHub or GitLab and we're gonna uh, really create a repository, a forking repository, create branches where we're gonna upgrade, upgrade and update the platform and the different component. Every, uh, in, ev in the same way you, you're developing software. It's really interesting in some, in some because you could really uh, release seeing what you're doing and giving back and uh, sharing the same tooling and giving back to the project all the, the elements they needed to, uh, to do their job. And, uh, uh, for these studies, we, we did it for a client, and you could say at this time, uh, the idea is to have a multi-cloud uh, cu multi Kubernetes, meaning for each entities of the organization, they need a new cluster setup, but they would like to manage and to centralize uh, the setup of the cluster uh, with a central team. And uh, it's an interesting, and I really um, encourage you to look at uh, this uh, different solution. As you know, I'm as an open source peop guy, I could say, today you have only Rancher and the new Red Hat components, not yet available open source, but ready. They are really open source. And on our side, we just release and reuse open source tooling. We show you, um, the, we use the term of Ansible Tower, you will see because it's a commercial version, but you could so also use AWX. But I think um, because uh, the work of the editor is really important, we have also to promote the, the enterprise edition. To, to go on this side and uh, on this uh, complex discussion, I would like to, to go on the, what we name centralize and decentralize. The idea be behind the GitOps approach for multi-cloud Kubernetes is you have to centralize the deployment as a configuration of all the cluster across region. And need you, you have to be sure if there is consistency on the configuration, on the security restriction, or the airbag role, on everything you're gonna say it's the basic security component of the Kubernetes. The decentralization is giving on each team, local team could be an ops team. For example, uh, uh, international company, we have, for example, uh, uh, the uh, OpenShift team in France may maintaining the platform engineering and maintaining the platform and you have a team in Japan, okay? When, when, what you would like to be sure when you deploy an open shift in Japan, you would like to be sure they're gonna have the best, uh, best of breed uh, open shift implementation or Kubernetes implementation with the security layers and so on. But on the other end, you don't, you, you don't want to manage this open shift uh, instead of them. You know, if this is on their job, they rely on their project, they depend on their constraints locally, and that's what we name decentralization. Decentralization is to say, to give back enough capabilities and power on the platform to the local team to be allowed to uh, extend the cluster, uh, be able to create namespace, be able to, to, to give some capabilities and uh, on the application owner and so on, and so on, leveraging service mesh and so on. And uh, it's, it's really interesting and it's really, uh, I see more and more client and more and more user seeing this way of light and this way of double uh, approach. An example of this, uh, we could say, um, we could say uh, I'm gonna move my video here, sorry, because <laughs> if there is some animation. Uh, yeah, it's an example, you know, you see we have a Git repository, you could see different tooling we put there, uh, this is an open stack infrastructure, but you will see after that we could have a, a, a public cloud, a private cloud, uh, any infrastructure. You have a vanilla Kubernetes, but it could be also an open shift, uh, a rancher or another uh, Kubernetes distribution. And you're gonna have some tooling, you're not gonna see. Uh, first, uh, in your DevOps approach, you're gonna have 
uh, deploying and managing and updating cluster. You're going to use uh, on this, we're going to see in the demo, but in the way we're implementing them, you're going to use Ansible, uh, Terraform, and Vault, and Git, for example, to deploy. And concretely, when you would like to create a cluster, you, you already have configured uh, a way of deploying the cluster on infrastructure, the way of integrating and installing First, installing the infrastructure layer after installing Kubernetes. Third, applying, apply all the rules you would like to apply on the clusters, meaning uh, airbag rules, security rules, policy rules, and so on. After that, you're going to have the monitoring alerting. We're going to centralize the monitoring alerting with uh, Prometheus uh, Alert Manager, and this one it's Thanos. I don't know if you, you know the Thanos project from the Cloud Native Computing Foundation, it's really interesting. And the idea is to, even if you deploy uh, 50 different um, platform, you're going to uh, really gather it and converge all on the monitoring in the same interface. That allow you just to, you just imagine you create your new cluster, you say it's a cluster Japan 1, Japan 2, Japan 3, Japan 4, and at the end of the day, you're going to have all the information about the monitoring uh, on the same place and on your same monitoring interface, and particularly on uh, uh, all tooling, they're going to alert you about what happened because it's alerting the most important. But also, you're going to share locally with local team. Oh, they're going to have their own Prometheus, own alert manager, and on our side, you could uh, also see the same thing at the higher level of the organization. It's really interesting to see that. Uh, this multi cluster, you're going to see we put. Uh, on the monitoring side, you have to centralize the information, but also give back to the local team the capabilities to 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 monitor and to uh, um, to maintain their platform on their on their side. Also, this is deploying, updating, namespace, security, and apps hybridization is really interesting on this scenario because putting uh, service mesh as the um, as the networking layer as your main networking component that allow you particularly to uh, deploy apps in the different cluster with a possibility to create communication uh, communication bridge between two clusters. Explain myself. If you put, for example, service mesh in the it's issue here, if you put as a, as a central services among different clusters, you could say, okay, my component, my namespace, my pod could communicate with this cluster in this region through my service mesh features. And is is how you're going to complexify you have private and public cloud approach, is really to say okay service mesh now is not only uh, a feature it's not only dedicated to uh, developers it's really a, str a way uh, how you're going to organize and strategically organize your network uh, dependency and your communication among your different cluster and different region. It's, uh, it's really interesting. Also, here you have a vault, you, you have some components, uh, you, you build the consistency leveraging ELM, for example. Uh, just to be sure, you're going to deploy the same thing, uh, the cluster, on the same way on, in, on each different uh, platform. That's really important in this detailed architecture. We're talking about the ops point of view from the centralized team. This is the point of view of the centralized team. Just to let you know, uh, if you go on these details, uh, first you create your, it's a the Jolic way of working, you create your environment with Ansible Tower, Terraform, you have your different repo, you create your repo, there is or not a depot already existing, do I have specific content locally I have to integrate and to update and so on. And after when you finish to create uh, your environment, you have to create the depot of your environment to be sure you're going to upgrade it, you know, and, and link and connect with, for example, ServiceNow or, or all the external components. Second, you have create the cluster itself. You have your environment, it's VMs, it's CS, it's bore metal. After you create your environment, your cluster, uh, you're going to deploy Kubernetes, apply all the airbag rules, namespace, security policy, and so on. And also, you're going to create, automate all the connection of your cluster with the different tooling you have to be sure there is consistency or there is a connection. And this is the second part, you know. And same thing, you're going to see on the GitLab repo or Git repo where is your cluster images, where is the different component, where are your repo, where is your registry, and so on. 
and uh, and third, it's uh, configuration inside the cluster. As I mentioned, after you finish to deploy your cluster, you're gonna apply different rules on configuration. You're gonna, for example, create user, uh, airbag, uh, a namespace role, and maybe also create the um, the gate to connecting your API to discuss with AD, for example, if you have an AD or uh, LDAP component. Is where you go. You will see. You follow three different layers, and you're gonna follow roots and a logical approach with all GitLab, with their own Git, Git repo, own way of creation, own way of building consistency across uh, your different deployments. On the other side, we could say, uh, uh, on this side, if you look at uh, this infrastructure on two different point of view, on the left side, you have the point of view of the application owner. Uh, is he could do, uh, we in this, is he could be, it's a different layer of what we saw because we use console on this project, Ansible Tower and OpenShift mostly, but uh, with different components, as you say, uh, as you could see. But the idea is uh, you're gonna have access to the same GitLab, uh, you're gonna Git repo, you're gonna deploy and connect your infrastructure, but you go, the limitation will is gonna be on the way of you can't manage directly infrastructure. You can change infrastructure organization and you can't access or all the admin roles or admin user access to your infrastructure. But you're gonna do some creating a namespace, a set of rules, everything you think as an organization, you have to, to decentralize because it's gonna be easier to be deployed by the local team. It's really depend on how far you would like to go on the on the on the on the, on the dependent uh, not dependency I could say on the autonomous uh, how, how how far you would like your team is going to work uh, uh, without any external help and be by on their own. On the right side, it's the dev user side, where you're going to see they're going to use Ansible Tower uh, on some way to deploy M Sharp, for example, or or uh, really. Um, uh, for example, have access to the project or Ansible is going gonna, is gonna to create the project or the local project. And uh, after, you could say you have the traditional uh, loop of implementing uh, your codes uh, into the platform. And it's interesting, you could see on the different side, uh, different steps, we could say you, we're all using the same tooling, we're all working on with the same approach, and we're all sharing the same practice. So everything else, it's a way of working, it's a way of thinking, it's a, a, a set of rules, a set of uh, uh, an approach about security, user management, multi-tenant approach. But is what we you're looking today on the DevOps uh, GitHub side. The next slide I'm gonna is gonna be uh, we're gonna move to uh, to Johan, and Johan is gonna is gonna give you, uh, give you uh, show you a demo about uh, this implementation. Thank Jonathan for this introduction. So, uh, <coughs> just give me a second. So, for this demonstration, we have already created a small infrastructure inside uh, AWS. Uh, if we have to represent what have been created actually. Uh, it should be the core services uh, that Jonathan explained just before. So actually I am able to, to show you how we have structured the GitLab to allow us just okay. Uh, to allow us to separate all the different elements that should be able deployed. So for example, for the platform, we have actually uh, created some AKS environment, OpenShift, Kubevania, and EKS. Inside, we will be able to found the Terraform code that have been created. So Uh, for the infrastructure, we have created um, a jump server to securize the connection to 
uh, the different cluster as we don't want that the cluster should be able to connect directly to internet and to be accessible directly to internet for security reason evidently and uh, just before you have all the different elements the different software element that will be deployed so inside each one you will be able to found the helm chart that should be uh, packaged and uploaded inside the Arbor registry that will be later used by Ansible and Elm to deploy the different elements and configure them depending of uh, the need of the client team. So if I go inside Ansible Tower We'll be able to find all the different models that have been already created. So we have the deployment of uh, the platform itself as a workflow. So we will be able to found inside the workflow the three different steps that Jonathan presented just before. As for example, the, the Terraform deployment for the infrastructure and later we'll be able to found the different step of configuration like uh, the securization of uh, the jump server the creation of the admin account for the team that should be responsible of uh, the infrastructure the installation of the different um, dependency like elm aws client if the um, target infrastructure is uh, based on AWS, the creation of the, cluster, the Kubernetes cluster itself, and later we'll be able to found the creation of uh, the user uh, inside the cluster. And finally, we will be able to found so, uh, the most important part uh, in this logic it's uh, all the different playbook that permit to deploy the, the, the software inside the cluster so if I take for example uh, the, this one that permit to deploy uh, a Mattermost uh, services uh, we'll be able to found that uh, we have set some uh, standard configuration for Mattermost uh, and that will permit us to know on each server where uh, or if I can say more exactly in which namespace uh, the software will be deployed so that permit us to keep a logical structure between all the different clusters but uh, we'll be still be able to have some um, custom configuration uh, at launch because uh, we will be asked by a survey to specify some elements like uh, the, um, the size of uh, the PV that will be used uh, and also which um, name should be used for uh, the ingress and elements like that that will eagerly permit us to specify the which version of uh, the Elm package that we have generated before should be used uh, for an initial installation and also for uh, updating the software. So that permit us to, with only one playbook, to have a full life cycle of um, of and so for the software. So, for example, uh, if we go to 
to a full uh, demonstration uh, with Mattermost to to do a, for a first deployment and uh, an update. I will take this one. So we will be asked on which cluster we want. If I save and don't launch, that will not work so well. <laughs> so uh, I, I will be asked first in which uh, cluster I want to deploy my uh, my software. So for this case, I will take uh, the cluster created for the demo. I will have been asked all the different elements uh, that should be specified for the deployment. Uh, a lot of elements are um, automatically set and is standard, but we will be permitted to change. For example, uh, I don't want to have uh, Mattermost as the name of uh, the, this service inside the URL that will be used. Uh, I want, for example, to have uh, the ingress name it chat. So, okay, I launch it. And if I jump back in my terminal, I will connect directly to the jump server that will be uh, able us to, to see what we have. So, Okay, so here we will be able to find the, the Mattermost that I just deployed. It's the version that we have uh, just specified before. And I will be able to check eagerly if the, the ingress have been correctly set by, uh, by AWX because AWX will generate uh, with the different values that we have set, it will generate the Elm values that should be used during the deployment. So, uh, get ingress. So, yes, I can found my Mattermost services and the ingress that has been specified, it's the correct one. So, it's chat, as I, was, as I have said. And after, it's something that has been specified directly during the Terraform deployment. We have set which um, base name should be used for all kind of ingress. So inside the end, I just specified the name, the specific name of the service and not all the URL. It's that permit the dev to just focus on the software that are that they are currently developing and not uh, all the ops on your uh, ops stuff. So, yes, actually I have deployed my service. I have the 0.1.0 uh, uh, version, but if I create a new version, so uh, actually <laughs> we will change, uh, just change the the number version, I will not change many things inside as uh, we are a little short on, on time. Okay. So now that I have pushed the new version, my pipeline should have been triggered. Yes. Yeah, we we'll just have to wait a bit. He finished to build uh, the M package and to push it inside Arbor.
okay the version 0.2.0 is not available so if i'm going and go back in directly in uh, awx i will be able to launch uh, my uh, my deployment playbook again but this time i will specify with uh, no not page I will be able to specify the version, uh, the new version. Okay. So, the demo cluster, and I want to have the new version of it. I will uh, equally change the ingress name. I will uh, this time keep the correct one. So it will change uh, again the ingress. Okay. I want it. This time I will stay on uh, on the action we, uh, realized by uh, by AWX just to to permit you to to see how it was done. So we create a. Uh, tempor uh, temporary directory inside the server where we will be able to found uh, the um, m values that have been used and now it's okay it's deployed okay so if i check again we now have uh, the mass the matter must with the version 0.2.0 that have been deployed and the ingress should should have changed to to yes this time it's correctly set to mattermost.apps so as you have been able to see uh, we are totally able to create uh, services deploy them and update them quite easily i just have to uh, to push my code inside GitLab and to launch it directly with a, um, a survey inside AWX. I don't have to know how um, the Elm command uh, work and elements like that. As uh, for now, I just show you the command because it was for the demo and we want to test it. But a final user should not have to use it. So he is now able to directly connect to his Mattermost services. Oh, I just change the URL to match what we have set. Oh, Mattermost, let's go. Should be better. And I delete this part too. Is it S? Oh yeah, okay. We take it. Okay, and my service is up and ready. So I just give back the end to Jonathan. You could say uh, even uh, to us together. Oh, Maybe okay, we're gonna together. you're gonna switch on the on the presentation just to to finish and to conclude, and uh, we're gonna happy to to have some question about uh, from you. First, uh, we're going to say a big thanks. Uh, we are both open source guys, and we, we, if we hear and if we work like this today, is because of the huge work from the community. I say the GNU Linux community. Don't forget free software also and Linux. This is the basics, of course. The Cloud Native Coptic Foundation and all the good guys were contributing uh, today. And first, uh, again, a thank you to Open Source Summit and the work of Linux Foundation. And because if all of you guys doing your job, we could do it uh, ours. And I think it's important to, to give back. And now we we okay to, we have 10 minute um, question answer session and we're gonna be happy to, to answer your question into the chat. And thank you very much to listen us and uh, see you next uh, event, maybe physically this time. Bye. Bye.